This is Money Guide with Mary Stirk from Stirk Financial Services. Now, here's Mary Stirk. You've built your business. It probably has become your baby. And now you have to sell your baby. And that can be a very difficult time in somebody's life and, and kind of tough to look ahead at. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is a few things to know about determining the value of your business and different ways that you can think about selling the business when it's time in your life to make that transition. So today I have with me Kelsey Banky. Kelsey is a CFP here at Stirk Financial. Welcome, Kelsey. Thanks, Mary. Glad to be back. So one of the... the um, most uh, important things in somebody's retirement plan can be the business that they've spent their life working on. And recently I had an experience where I worked on a succession planning team and it was a, a long standing family business. It had owners in the family that were siblings. And we had a situation where kids of these siblings were now going to start taking over the family business. So as you can believe there was a lot of different opinions and perspectives and pieces to work through. Uh, some of the kids were married and their spouses had opinions and, uh, you know, family dynamics can be kind of funny. So uh, we also had to factor in health issues, contingency plans, and then finished with a, a very long-term plan for the sellers of how this transaction could maybe impact them. And what I what I definitely took away from the situation is that it absolutely is doable to come up with a great transition plan, but I think that it's incredibly important to make sure that you have a team helping you with that, and your team really should con consist of several people. Yeah, you're going to want your attorney, you're going to want a CPA, and you're going to want a financial planner, and those three uh, individuals have a variety of knowledge and information and experience to help think through all the different pieces of selling a business and all the different um, rules and opportunities and also risks that there are in doing all of this and making sure that it's all set up exactly how you've discussed and decided that it's going to take place and making sure that everybody is protected in that, in that uh, transaction. Yeah, and so what's interesting about it, too, is the role that these advisors can play in the transition of a business being sold. So um, if you're going to sell it to your family, it's possible for everybody to work with the same team. Um, but I do think that there's merit to the idea that both the seller and the buyer, even within the family, might want to have their own unique team um, because... Um, while the overall goal is the transition of the business, the agenda of a buyer and a seller, whether it's inside the family or not, is different. The seller wants to make sure that the business can continue, that the customers are taken care of, that they create the best value for themselves so they can exit the business. And while there's common ground that the buyer wants the business to continue and the customers to be taken care of, their main goal is getting the best value when purchasing the business so that they can continue to grow and expand it and have a, a viable business for themselves going forward. So there's some disparity in the overall goals of everybody. And so that's why it might make sense to have um, multiple advisory teams, depending on how complex the transaction actually is going to be. Okay. So know that the business is like your baby and that it's going to be hard to part with. But the other thing to know is that the actual value of your business might be completely different than what you think the value of it is. So Mary, can you tell us a couple of different ways that a business can be valued and how you might go about getting that information? Yes. So first of all, you do have to do a business valuation and the, the business valuation itself is a key component to not only determining how you're going to sell it, but it's going to be a key component in your estate planning. And I'll tell you who's going to be the most interested in the value of your business is the IRS. Oh, darn it. <laughs> <laughs> because the way that it's valued and what is assigned value is absolutely of interest to them because they want to know how they can collect taxes on the sale of your business. So they're going to be very interested in, in what your valuation method was. So there's a couple different ways of valuing things. Number one, um, there's a rule of thumb valuation, okay? And a rule of thumb valuation um, is kind of a loosely um, 
calculated valuation. So for instance, let's say in, in my industry, in the financial industry, the value of a practice has to do with multiples of revenue. Okay, so whatever your revenue is that your your business generates, a rule of thumb might be two to three times the the multiple of that. Or depending on if you're a manufacturing company, it's not necessarily a multiple of revenue. It would be a multiple of EBITDA. So EBITDA, that's earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation allowances. And so um, you have to kind of do a little research and investigate are there any rules of thumb in your industry? So, for instance, a manufacturing company, it might be seven to eight times EBITDA um, that it's the company is worth. Um, but then there's also additional rules of thumb that say, hey, if your EBITDA is below five million, your multiple is four to five times. If your EBITDA is above twenty million, your your multiple is eight to ten times. So the the rules of thumbs are good to know, but there's often nuances within them that really kind of point you towards what that specific value is. Now, you can use a rule of thumb, but if you're a big enough business, you're really not going to be sold on just the rule of thumb. You're going to probably have to get an actual business valuation done. And business valuations are costly. They're expensive to do. I've seen people pay many, many thousands of dollars to do a full-on business valuation. I've seen them as little as 5000 but I've also seen them well above 100000 too. And there are not very many people that do business valuations. We don't do them, but we can refer you to someone who does do them that we think does a good job. Um, When they do that, though, there is um, the income approach and the asset approach to determining value. So the income approach, the methodology is really based on how you expect to generate income from your company going forward. And the asset approach is determined on the basis of what the assets of the business actually are. And so when you're working with your business valuator, you really want to look at those different ways of doing it and to see which one creates the highest sale value that can be justified and borne out by your business valuation. Because as a seller, of course, you want it to be highest possible value that you're selling it for, right? (laughs) Absolutely. You built something up, you want to reap the benefit of it. Right. So, you know, it's kind of like farming, I guess, is a good analogy to use for this. Your blood, sweat, and tears go into building this business. And if you don't harvest your farm crop right, then nothing really comes of it. So you work really, really hard to plant the seeds in the spring, and then you have to work really, really hard to harvest them in the fall. That's why farming works. And if you think about your business in the same kind of terms, you spent all these years working really, really hard to plant the seeds of this business and to get it to grow. And now adopting the right sales approach and the right valuation is the same as harvesting it. You're harvesting that value to pass down in your estate, to retire on, or to leave to your family. Okay. Let's shift a little bit and talk about a few different ways that um, you can sell your business. Um, But before we talk about selling it, I want to talk about something that's called a contingency plan. So a contingency plan is something that all business owners should have, regardless of whether or not they're actually ready to sell their business right now. So there are a few different things that can create the need for a contingency plan. If you die, I hope you have a contingency plan in place. If you become disabled and you can no longer take care of your company, I hope you have a contingency plan in place. Um, According to an article in Forbes, founder entrepreneurs are the glue that hold a business together. So if you founded the company, then your company, generally speaking, is held together because of of your initial efforts and influence and continued work. And statistically, if the founder entrepreneur dies unexpectedly, the average lifespan of the business is only four years after the death of that entrepreneur. And generally speaking, in that time frame, the sales of that company dip by over 60%. Wow. That's a, a large dip there. Right. So if you have a business as part of your um, financial retirement planning, and it's supposed to take care of you and your spouse, then think about that fact. If, if you passed away unexpectedly or if you became disabled and could no longer work in the business, the um, success level of that business going forward without your involvement 
diminishes greatly. And when it diminishes greatly like that, so does the sale value. So having a contingency plan in place before an issue happens like this, I think is incredibly important to do. Absolutely. Contingency plan can just help make sure that those unexpected things that come at any time in your life, that those aren't going to completely just kill off your business and make it impossible for your uh, spouse or uh, loved ones to be able to benefit from this business that you, you built. Right. So we've built a really great business succession planning kit and a checklist of the things to think about in a succession plan. You can give us a call at 605-217-3555. We'd be happy to email this to you. And really, it's going to be um, going through what the general information are, what the basics are, how you go about selling a business interest, how you go about valuing it, and things like that. And uh, it's a great resource for anybody who's thinking in the next few years they might want to sell their company. Congratulations to Mary Stirk and the team at Stirk Financial for earning a spot on two Forbes lists for six years running, including 2023 Forbes Best in State Wealth Advisors and 2023 Forbes Top Women Wealth Advisors Best in state number one in South Dakota. So you can transfer your business interest with a buy-sell agreement. And basically what a buy-sell agreement is, is a legal contract that prearranges the sale of your business. Okay. So it's something that you've decided on in advance. And a buy-sell agreement frequently happens between partners or multiple owners of a business. And, um, it really can help you solve problems inherent in attempting to sell a closely held business. Because when you put your agreement together, you can really tailor it to your own needs. Absolutely. A buy-sell agreement can be very customized to exactly uh, what is appropriate for your industry, for your partnership. And it can make sure that both uh, both sides are taken care of in the event that a, a sell needs to happen, whether it be, um, you know, you've become disabled and can't work in the business any longer or, or you pass away. Um, that's probably most frequently where the buy-sell agreements um, are, are most beneficial is, you know, if, if your partner's with one other person in a business and that person and passes away, uh, not only are their family members looking to s- continue to get some kind of value from it, whether it be selling it or income, um, but you're also, you know, livelihood still depends on that business and you're going to want to make sure it continues. So um, instead of getting into a situation where you have a fire sale for your part of the business or a business owner being in a, a the, the remaining business owner not being able to purchase it appropriately and maybe being forced to sell it as a whole, a buy-sell agreement sets all of that uh, framework into place to allow you to both be protected in the in the instance that you need to sell that uh, at, at an untimely event. Yeah. And, and some of the things that Kelsey's talking about are called triggering events, right? So a triggering event in a buy-sell would be something like death or disability, but a triggering event can also be a retirement or a divorce or a bankruptcy. Because it's it happens all the time that somebody's divorce all of a sudden impacts your business because they're a partner in your business. And so if you can prearrange ahead of time how some of those things can affect your business and create the parameters in your buy-sell, it really helps solidify the value of your business. The other thing is that the buy-sell agreement provides a ready buyer for your interest. So if you have the triggering event happen, then you or your family or your estate is spared the task of trying to find a buyer when you're ready to sell your business, which is kind of nice. One thing about buy-sell agreements is that the price and the sale terms are generally pre-arranged. So you decide ahead of time how you're going to value this business. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the dollar amount of the business is pre-arranged. What it usually means is that the methodology or the formula to figure out what the price of the business is, is pre-arranged. So at the time that you draft the agreement, you figure out what that formula is going to be. And then when the agreement is triggered, then you plug numbers into the formula to see who's going to get what money and how and when. Um, One of the things though, that happens when you're bound under a buy-sell agreement is you generally can't 
sell your business to someone else. So it is usually a binding agreement. And so that can have an effect on your estate planning. So if you have a significant amount of value wrapped up in the business that you own and you are going to enter into a buy-sell with partners or somebody, then um, you want to make sure that you have coordinated the estate planning documents that you have on file with the buy-sell. Okay? So... Buy sells can be um, handled with cash deals. Buy sells can be having what's called a sinking fund set up where you're contributing money to create a cash pool for someone to fund that buy sell agreement. Or buy sells are very frequently funded with life insurance. So if there's two partners and they both have, uh, let's say, $2 million worth of interest in the business, you might end up buying a $2 million life insurance policy on each partner. And if the partner passes away, then the other partner has the cash to buy out the $2 million business interest from the deceased partner's family or estate. That's the simplest version of how a buy-sell works, but they're very effective. Um, the biggest thing I see as a as a whole to avoid when you're doing buy sell planning and funding it with life insurance is that you don't have enough insurance to account for the fact that the business grows. So a lot of times people will say, "Oh, well, the business is worth four million dollars now. We each need a two million dollar policy." Well, hopefully nobody's dying anytime soon. But if they're going to die ten or twenty years in the future and your business has multiplied a couple of times, you want to take that into consideration because that $2 million of insurance might not be enough to buy out the share based on the growth of the company. So do some forward looking when you decide on amounts. Okay, next we're going to go ahead and talk about um, some of the issues that you might have if you're going to do an outright sale. And an outright sale might be to somebody that's outside your family, or it might be to somebody from inside the family. So if you're going to keep your business inside the family, there are a number of different issues that might come up. Absolutely, Mary. And, and you know, a lot of people, they want to keep things in the family. They want to pass it down. They want the family to continue to participate in this business, to continue to um, provide the benefits, products, services, whatever um, your business does to your community or to your uh, area. And the, the family issue is a very sensitive one. But there are still a lot of issues that can go into that that need to be considered. Um, for instance, uh, conflicting needs of family and business? Well, you know, one of the best things you can do if you have conflicting needs of a family and a business is to engage a family council. So to form a family council that can assist in strategic planning for both the business and the family needs. There, There's a lot of family dynamics in every family I've ever met. And the bottom line with that is uh, as long as you have open communication, you can figure some of these things out. I definitely also see identity issues um, with that, you know, children who are wanting to take over the business, you might as an owner and as a parent or a, a uncle or aunt to that child or grandparent, you still remember them as a kid and still remember them, you know, maybe make, not making some wise decisions when they were growing up, but they've matured and evolved and now they want to take a partnership or ownership or participate in the family business, and it's and it's hard to start seeing them now as a colleague instead of just a child that you're you're raising through the tough times of right. of teenage <laughs> years. So uh, that's definitely another one, and trying to help identify what role everybody's going to play and and where are they best suited. So um, another issue of selling your business to family is that the IRS scrutiny on the valuation of your business it tends to be at a different level. So um, Sometimes people are guilty of wanting to keep the business in the family, so they might discount the value of it, in which case there's not as much tax that will be due when that transaction takes place. So that's why the IRS sticks their nose in a little bit more and tends to scrutinize those transactions a little bit more. What they're just looking for is to make sure that the business is actually sold for the fair market value. So keep that in mind that if you're going to try to sell your business for less than fair market value, you could run into a little bit of an IRS um, issue and might you, you just want to be careful about doing that Um or discounting it too heavily. And that's definitely where the the team of people can come into play. Your attorney, your financial planner, and your CPA, they can come in and help 
uh, you know, guide and educate and advise you on how all of that works with the IRS and, and things that you need to watch out for and things you need to do to make sure that you're protecting yourself in that situation. Right. So ultimately, when you sell your business to a family member, your objective may be to keep the business within the family and make it as easy as possible for your relative to make the purchase. But when you sell your business to non-family, your primary objective may be to get the highest possible price for the sale and also delay recognition of capital gains or taxation as long as possible uh, within the type of deal that you structure. So there's a couple different objectives depending on whether you're selling it to family members or non-family members. Um, Also, there's different tax situations when you're selling it to another corporation versus to an actual person. So there's ways that you can structure it from tax purposes to minimize taxes with capital gains treatment. There's ways that you might end up maximizing taxes with asset sales and things like that. So you really want to involve your CPA and your attorney to understand what is the deal with the taxes on things. Now, you also could gift your business away. And I often get the question of, why would I gift my business to somebody? All right, so let's take the family farm, for example. Okay, if you retire as a farmer and decide you want to sell your farm to your kids, to the next generation to take it over, there are going to be taxes due when you sell that. However, with farm ground, if you pass away, there's something called a step up in basis. And so a step up in basis means that your kids can inherit the farm without paying a lot of capital gains taxes on that. And it effectively moves the family farming business to the next generation and avoids a lot of the taxes. So you can consider that to be gifting at your death. You consider that to be a transfer at your death. But ultimately, there are some very good tax reasons to consider doing that depending on the type of business that you have. So we've talked a lot about business succession planning today. And when it's time to sell that company, give us a call to request your business succession planning kit and the checklist of what to think about with that. And uh, you can reach us at 605-217-3555 and uh, have some good, valuable information for when it's time to sell your business. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of your audio provider and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities or services mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. No strategy can ensure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information should only be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Securities and investment advisory services are offered through Woodbury Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Insurance offered through Sterk Financial Services, which is not affiliated with Woodbury Financial Services Incorporated. Neither Woodbury Financial Services Incorporated nor its representatives provide tax or legal advice. You should consult a qualified attorney or tax professional to answer your specific questions. Sterk Financial Services is located at 350 Oak Tree Lane, Suite 150, Dakota Dunes, South Dakota, 57049, and can be reached at 605 217 3555. Forbes Best in State Wealth Advisors list includes 10 recipients per state. The award is based on qualitative and quantitative data. Reading thousands of wealth advisors with a minimum of seven years of experience and weighing factors like revenue trends, assets under management, compliance records, industry experience, and best practices. The word is not based on portfolio performance or client reviews. There is no fee in exchange for rankings. Third-party rankings and recognitions are no guarantee of future investment success and do not ensure that a client or prospective client will experience a higher level of performance or results. These ratings should not be construed as an endorsement of the advisor by any client nor are they representative of any one client's evaluation.